Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities on Our Own Devices. I'm Jean Nessie, and today we're having a look at a fascinating piece of mid-century glassware. This Sunday dish here is an example of what's typically known as depression glass or depression ware or sometimes Vaseline glass. And this is a type of inexpensive glassware that was manufactured in very large quantities in the 1920s and 30s. And indeed, it was so inexpensive that it tended to be given away as a free prize or purchase incentive. So, for example, Quaker Oats would give away a piece of depression glass in a box of oatmeal, or gas stations, movie theaters, department stores would give away pieces as an incentive to patronize their businesses. So these were incredibly prolific pieces, yet today they command rather high prices because they have since become a highly valued collector's item. Now, depression glass was made in all sorts of shapes and sizes, every type of glassware that you could imagine, as well as many different colors. So some of the most common would be clear or crystal, as it was called, pink, amber, cobalt blue, and green. There were also less common shades, such as amethyst, black, and something called canary, which was a paler shade of yellow, a little bit greenish, and also tended to be somewhat translucent. And typically, when you're talking about Vaseline glass, that is what is meant, because it, it resembles original formulation Vaseline or petroleum jelly, that sort of greenish-yellow tinge. Although you'll often hear the terms used interchangeably, depression glass or Vaseline glass, to the discerning collector, they are not the same. They are very specific terms. And adding to the confusion, at the same time, there were a lot of other types of glassware that were very similar to depression glass. Uh, things like elegant glass, which used many of the same patterns, but was manufactured to a higher standard. So this was never given away as a freebie. This was just sold as regular glassware in stores. There was also custard glass, which had the same tinge as Vaseline glass, but had an opaque frosted finish. There was jadeite glass, which was about the same thing, only green and with that frosted finish. There was Burmese glass, which had a palette that faded from yellow to pink and was also opaque and frosted. And then finally, there was milk glass, which was an opaque white. But probably the most recognizable and well-known type of glassware from this era is this type with this transparent pale green cast to it. And that's because this color is achieved using a rather unexpected element, uranium. Now, today we associate uranium with nuclear technology, with reactors and bombs, but for nearly a century and a half after its discovery, about the only use anybody had for uranium was in coloring glass and ceramics. Now, uranium was discovered in 1789 by a German chemist named Martin Klaproth, and he originally worked with a uranium ore called torbernite. I later moved on to the more common and well-known ore pitch blend. And what he did was he dissolved the ore in nitric acid and precipitated it using sodium hydroxide to produce a bright yellow compound, which is probably sodium diurinate. Now, he assumed that this was an oxide of the actual metal that he was looking for, so he heated it with carbon to produce a black powder, which he thought was the actual metal, but which was probably a form of uranium oxide. And today, that form of uranium oxide is compressed into little pellets and stacked in zirconium tubes to form the fuel elements for nuclear reactors. Now, he named this new element uranium after the planet Uranus, which had recently been discovered in 1781 by William Herschel. Now, Klaproth was also responsible for the discovery of the element zirconium, and he was also the first to show that adding uranium to glass gave it this distinctive green color. However, the first manufacturer to start mass producing uranium glass in this fashion was the bohemian glassmaker Franz Rydell, who started producing uranium glass pieces in 1830. And indeed, his company provided a set of uranium glassware as a gift to Queen Victoria on her accession to the throne in 1837. And if the name Rydell sounds familiar, the company still exists today, and it still manufactures high-quality glassware such as wine glasses. And this type of uranium glass continued to be popular throughout the 19th century, reaching peak popularity in the 1880s. 
Now, its popularity wanes slightly after this point, but experienced another resurgence in the early 20th century. And by this point, uranium ore was being mined in large quantities all around the world, in the Belgian Congo, in Czechoslovakia, and in Canada, especially the El Dorado mine on the shores of Great Bear Lake in the Northwest Territories. But interestingly enough, the ore wasn't being mined for the uranium content. Rather, it was being mined for an element that was present in trace quantities in the ore, and this was radium. Now, of course, radium was discovered in 1898 by Marie and Pierre Curie, and it immediately found a number of uses, including in self-illuminating clock and watch dials, in cancer therapy, and an assortment of dubious and often very dangerous quack cures. And because it was present in such trace quantities, it took tons upon tons of pitch blend or other ores to extract just a few grams of radium. So for a long time, it was the most expensive metal in the world. And this processing produced massive quantities of uranium oxide that was essentially a worthless byproduct. Not many people had a use for it, except for glass makers and the makers of ceramic glazes. And if you want to learn a bit more about that and the use of uranium in ceramic glazes, please check out my video on Fiesta Ware. I'll put the link in the description. So uranium continued to mainly be used in this fashion for coloring glass and ceramics until the late 1930s when nuclear fission was discovered. And in 1942, when the Manhattan Project to produce the world's first atomic bomb really started getting underway, the U.S. government suddenly commandeered all stockpiles of uranium across the country, and the manufacture of uranium glass and ceramics effectively stopped. And it wasn't until 1958 that the government finally relaxed its stranglehold on uranium supplies, and manufacturers started producing uranium glass and ceramic once again. Although now they weren't actually using natural uranium as they had been before, but rather depleted uranium, which is the byproduct of enriching uranium for use in nuclear reactors and weapons. So it's essentially uranium with a lower content of uranium-235, which is the fissile isotope. Natural uranium has 0.72%. Depleted uranium has around 0.3% or less. And it's estimated between 1958 and 1978 that in the United States alone, some 4 million uranium glass pieces were produced. So there's a lot of it floating out around there. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, today depression glass, including uranium glass pieces like this one, are highly collectible and they command fairly high prices. But let's say you want to go out and find yourself a genuine piece of uranium glass. How do you tell that this actually contains uranium? Well, unfortunately, the color itself is not a 100% accurate indicator because this color can be achieved using other elements, including iron oxide and cerium oxide. Okay, well, uranium is radioactive, so hold a Geiger counter up to it. That works sometimes, uh, but unfortunately, uranium is an alpha emitter and alpha particles are easily blocked by glass. So a lot of them are trapped inside the glass and you only get a reading slightly above background radiation levels. Also, when this is colored with cerium oxide, that tends to contain impurities of thorium, which can also give a similar radiation signature to uranium. So then how do you tell if it contains uranium? Well, one of the best methods is to turn off the light and turn on a black light. So as you can see, one of the distinctive features of uranium glass is that under ultraviolet light, it glows this very distinctive bright fluorescent green. And that is one of the best ways of telling whether you're dealing with actual uranium glass. However, it isn't 100% foolproof. Let me show you something. So here I have a goblet that at first glance would appear to be made of uranium glass. The color is certainly right, but if I expose it to a black light, you'll see that this particular glass does not glow. Now, normally that would indicate that this does not contain uranium. This is probably colored with iron oxide or cerium oxide. But once again, this is not 100% foolproof because there are different types of uranium glass, including what is known as gemstone glass, that due to the particular formulation does not actually glow under a blacklight. So there is no single 100% foolproof method 
for finding uranium glass other than breaking off a piece and passing it through a mass spectrometer. But typically the black light method is good enough for most purposes. So even though these are rather expensive given what they are, if you do want to get yourself an interesting piece of chemistry and nuclear physics history, you can find uranium glass in pretty much any antique store, flea market, on eBay, pretty much anywhere. Anything ranging from little pieces of jewelry to uh, salt and pepper shakers to giant bowls. Whatever you have room for, whatever you have the budget for, whatever strikes your fancy. And if you can display it using a blacklight, all the better. It just looks really cool. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time on another episode of Cattative Curiosities, where we'll have a look at more fascinating objects just like these ones. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.